to order. And I understand Representative Zhang is back with us. And uh, I hope your two bills and your other committee went well. Representative Zhang, um, I will move, get it to right here. I will move House File 3237 uh, to be laid over for possible inclusion. Representative Zhang, um, you wanna present your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe I have a DE1 amendment. I see that here now. Yes, D. Representative Zhang, I'll move the DE1 amendment to put the bill in the in the form that uh, the author would like. Representative Zhang, you want to explain your amendment? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The amendment came um, to me after having conversation with our trades folks on our clarifications of the phrase goods and services, including uh, construction. So we opted to take out those changes out to keep that, that portion of the language as current law. Um, members, any questions? Otherwise, if everybody wants to unmute, um, we will move the amendment to put the uh, bill, the DE, the DE amendment to put the bill in the uh, form the author would like. All in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it, uh, the amendment's adopted. So Representative Zhang, you wanna explain what the bill does? Intended. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Nelson and members. House File 3237 is an admin's bill for small business program enhancements and state contracting clarification. It's an effort to increase state contracts with targeted groups, economic disadvantage, and veteran-owned small businesses. To do this, the administration uh, recommends expanding their small business program, increasing the preference that targeted groups, uh, economically disadvantaged, and veteran-owned small businesses receive a competitive bidding process, streamlining the certification process, uh, consistently applying Subcontractor goes to uh, all prime crack, all prime contractors, as well as some state contracting statute clarifications. Contracts with the state of Minnesota can help uh, target group economically disadvantaged and veteran-owned small businesses thrive and positively impact our uh, state. The admins uh, contracting proposals are an effort in increasing the use of the agency's small. Uh, business program and improving the likelihood that a targeted group economically disadvantaged uh, and veteran owned small business will earn a state contract. You all should have received uh, some documents uh, from the State Department of Admin, uh, which shows many great needs how this bill will benefit a lot of our communities in greater Minnesota. And uh, I have a, a few folks here today, including the commissioner to testify on this bill. And it's my notes, uh, Commissioner Roberts Davis has got a conflict at this time, but we have Miss Betsy Hayes here, the chief procurement officer for the Department of Admin. Um, and I see Miss Byerly here if, um, if to answer questions. But Miss Betsy David, Betsy Hayes, um, if you want to identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the committee. Um, for the record, uh, my name is Betsy Hayes. I'm the Chief Procurement Officer with the Department of Administration's Office of State Procurement. I wanna thank, uh, first of all, represent Representative Shang for authoring our bill today, which is Admin Small Business uh, Program Enhancements and State Contracting Clarifications Bill. Um, this bill, in short, will enhance our small business program. It's gonna help uh, grow our pool of vendors uh, that do business with the state, and it adds some clarifying uh, link or it adds some clarifications to our procurement language. Uh, throughout my testimony today, I'll be using the acronym TGEDVO, uh, and that means that it, that stands for a business that has been certified as part of our targeted group program, uh, it, or it, it's uh, economically disadvantaged is one of our 44 economically dis, uh, businesses from our 44 economically disadvantaged counties. Uh, and includes businesses owned by veterans as well. Um, now to the bill itself. Uh, first, we wanna make sure in the bill that we have uh, consistency with uh, language surrounding uh, the authority for subcontractor goals. 
Currently, the law authorizes the state to require a prime contractor to subcontract a portion of the contract to TGED VO vendors. However, those requirements do not apply to prime contractors who are themselves TGED uh, VO small businesses. So our bill changes that to make the requirements the same for all of the prime contractors, regardless of their status. This will even the playing field for all prime contractors. Admin is also proposing a clarification to the prohibition of the best and final offer negotiation technique. This change makes it clear that using uh, best and final offers for building construction contracts is prohibited when using the low bid technique, but is not prohibited under a best value process. The ability to negotiate proposals is important, is a, an important component of a, any best value procurement process. So this change in statute makes it clear that the prohibition on using the best and final offers applies okay. only to low bid processes and not the best value process. Next, we'd like to expand our small business program. The current program streamlines the procurement process for purchases under $25,000 when made from a TGED or VO business. It has been a really successful tool to increase the contracting opportunities with certified small businesses. Admin is proposing uh, to increase the $25,000 threshold to $100,000. This would expand the program, uh, give more flexibility to agencies and help spread the state's procurement dollars to more businesses. In addition to expanding our small business program, we are proposing to increase the percentage of preference uh, that a certified TGED video business uh, receives in a competitive bidding process from 6% to 12%. Admin conducted an internal analysis on contracts and found that this increase would help us to continue to vary the state spend on contracting. And our last item focuses on TGV uh, EDVO businesses, um, it's our proposal to streamline uh, the certification process. We would like to do this uh, by recognizing certifications that small businesses have received from nationally recognized certifying organizations as part of their state certification. Uh, the requirements would need to be substantially the same uh, as those adopted in Minnesota and approved by admin. So we would maintain our strong controls to ensure that there's not fraud in the program, uh, but be able to recognize the efforts of the businesses to achieve these national certifications as part of their state certification. And then finally, um, we, we have uh, a report cleanup. Uh, there is a reference to uh, uh, admin having to do reports to the legislature in 2013 and 2014. Um, those uh, reports were completed. Um, and uh, the requirement did not have recurring annual reports. So we're looking to delete this obsolete language. So with that, I wanna thank you for your time this morning. I'm happy to stand for any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. Uh, members, any questions? Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to the author or testifier, can you give me a consistent and reliable definition of uh, an economically disadvantaged area because I'm trying to figure out, we heard that this is available in I think 44 counties, but we've got 87. And I just wanted to understand what the, the parameters of an economically disadvantaged area is. And uh, I'll have other questions, Mr. Chair. Ms. Hayes. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Nash, um, the uh, economically disadvantaged businesses um, are defined by federal requirements. And I believe in your handouts today, uh, we have provided a map uh, that highlights which of those counties um, within Minnesota are uh, deemed by those definitions economically disadvantaged. So if you did not receive those handouts, um, I would be happy to follow up and get that to you, which shows you very specifically which counties they are. It's largely uh, outstate counties. And, uh, and members, there it, it, it is in our map. There's a map of that. Um, the ones in green, if you pull the map up, it's a lot of outstate rural counties, uh, Cooch, um, Kitson, Marshall, Red Lake County, Cook County, uh, Becker, Otter Tail. Like I said, mostly out, outstate counties that are, are listed in green that would be 
considered disadvantaged counties. Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I guess I'm just trying to ascertain if that's been updated relative to uh, some of the recent uh, happenings, but uh, I wanted to address the increase in the threshold. You know, I have been an advocate for transparency, good government, and uh, accountability, and I, I just, members, I can't support this. I don't support the fact that we are now elevating the, the level 200,000. Uh, I like scrutiny. I like details. I like the ability to track uh, money as it uh, not just drips out of state government, but it gushes out of state government. And I, I just find that while the expediency around elevating a level seems nice, I also think of the perspective of the taxpayer who is looking at this and saying, well, um, I, I would like to know where my tax dollars are going. And I just think we should keep the, the granularity that is currently in statute and not elevate the level 200,000. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Nash. Any further questions? Any uh, Mr. further Chair. questions? Uh, Ms. Ms. Hayes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to that comment, uh, Representative Nash, um, I just wanted to, to share that um, the increase, for example, um, from the 25 to 100,000, um, it is a level that's that's consistent with some other authorities, for example, that local uh, units have. They have, in fact, up to 175,000 um, where they can, uh, they have an expedited process to, to procure um, and, and that the transparency with respect to those procurements would remain the same, um, still subject to the same uh, data practices provisions. Um, and in fact, uh, being able to go direct to a, a certified targeted group business um, does um, save in a lot of the soft cost associated with the work and the administrative procedures that the uh, procurement officials need to do. So in, in fact, um, there's some efficiencies gained by increasing that threshold. Representative Nash, did you put your hand back up? It looks like it went yes, down. Yes, Mr. Chair, just very, very quickly. So would that then be predicated on having to submit a, a, a FOIA request to get that data? Because I will tell you, having done that, uh, it takes forever. So perhaps the transparency may not be as transparent as one might hope. Um, I find that getting a FOIA request or a data request out of any state agency to be very cumbersome, time consuming and frustrating as hell. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Nash. Uh, Representative Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Representative Zhang, for bringing this bill forward. I can tell you when I've talked to a lot of business owners, particularly that would fit this, this smaller category, that this is something they've been asking for, candidly, to be given more opportunity. And, and this bill gives them a little bit more flexibility and a little bit more opportunity. And so it really is a great bill in terms of being able to allow more of these businesses to get a foothold in the door and really make a difference in building their business. So thank you for that, and I appreciate the bill. Thank you, Representative Bonner. Seeing no further hands, um, Representative Zhang, you want to wrap up your bill, and then we'll uh, lay the silver for, for inclusion. Thank you, Chair Nelson and members of the committee. This bill, again, is really uh, for supporting our small businesses and veteran-owned businesses. I want to reiterate that small businesses and veteran owned businesses in greater Minnesota folks, for those of you who keep saying, oh, we're too Metro based. Well, this is your opportunity to support legislation that will benefit those in greater Minnesota who have been, if you look at the map, deemed as economically disadvantaged. This is to help them. I appreciate your support, Mr. Uh, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Zhang. And with that, members, we'll lay this bill over for possible inclusion. Um, members, um, the next bill on the agenda is House File 3986. And I, it's a Nelson M. Bill. I don't know who that guy is, but I will hand the, the uh, uh, gavel over to uh, Representative Carlson, Vice Chair Carlson, and uh, um, take it from there. Thank you, Chair Nelson. Uh, would you like to move your bill, House File 3986? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I will move House File 3986. And again, this is gonna be laid over for possible inclusion. Wonderful. Uh, Chair Nelson, uh, would you like to proceed with some uh, information regarding your bill? And members, this is the bar. This is the bill that came out of the Barbers um, Council. Um, this is just an update of their statute. Some some minor changes. Um, one one major change is the, having to do with the appointment of uh, members to the Barbers Examiners Board, uh, the uh, or the Board of Barber Examiners. Currently, there is a position that's that requires that the union of journeyman barbers uh, appoint one person to the board. Currently, there is no longer a statewide union of, of journeyman barbers, and so therefore they're striking that to, to allow, uh, you know, for like an update the statutes. Um, as to ask, there's some fees here. They're putting in the, there's been a request and talk for the last few years, and they, the, the Barbers Examiner's Board has gone through this about uh, mobile barber shops, and there's been a, a desire for some people to create mobile, mobile barber shops. Um, that's that's probably the meat of the of the bill is the language around creating that mobile barber shop. The um, how you know the regulations around that, the fees around that, um, similar to the fees that would be for a regular barber shop. There's also in here um, a piece about allowing. There's been some some questions or requests for cosmetologists who wish to become barbers and the way it currently is under statute, they have to start from the beginning and go all the way through. Um, this is giving them some credit for their times and their, their work getting a cosmetology license towards getting their barber license and switching over to becoming a barber as opposed to cosmetologist. Um, there are some quite changes there here on the examination schedule. Current statute says they have to do it six times a year or not, they're six times a year now it says they have to do it at least four times a year. I think it's not, it was before, not more than six times a year. Um, and getting that's that's basically it. Uh, what the bill does is basically an update of the statute for the Barber's Examination Board. And with that, members, I'll take questions. And uh, uh, we have a Mr. Testifier here, uh, Mr. Brent Gribanowski from the, Mr. Chair. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Chair Nelson. Appreciate your opening comments. Uh, we do have a testifier, Mr. Brett Grebanowski. Uh, Mr. Grebanowski, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Uh, would you like to proceed with your testimony? Thank you. Uh, my name is Brent Grebanowski. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Board of Barber Examiners. And I would like to thank you for the opportunity to uh, let me present uh, House File 3986 today. Um, Representative Nelson has gone over many of the, the things I'm already going to talk about, um, so I'll just touch on them briefly. Um, this bill addresses five ma major things in Barber Rule and Statute. Um, the first two are recommendations from the Office of the Legislative Auditor um, regarding cosmetology uh, reciprocity. Um, this bill would establish a process where licensed cosmetologists can be credited with up to 1,000 hours of their training and study. Uh, toward becoming a barber through reciprocity. Secondly, this bill looks to better define the differences between barbering and cosmetology. It defines straight razor shaving as being a barber service, and it defines the procedure of waxing and explains that it is not in the scope of practice for a barber. This bill also addresses registered barber examinations. It Remove some onerous requirements for barber students who fail examinations. Uh, right now, if you fail the barber examination, you have to go back to school for 500 hours. We want to eliminate that. It provides the board with additional flexibility in offering more frequent examinations to get barber students working in their chosen field more quickly. Um, this bill also establishes definitions, fees, and provisions for mobile barber shops, which would allow barbers to safely practice their trade outside of a barber shop, and would allow barbers to reach customers who may be homebound or who may simply lack a brick and mortar barber shop in their community. 
Um, and lastly, this bill eliminates requirements for board member appointments that are outdated. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll make myself available. Thank you, Mr. Rebanowski, for your testimony. Uh, I do see we have uh, no further testifiers, so we'll move on to member questions. Uh, Representative Mason, I see you've got your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, one disclaimer, I do have a bill that's updating cosmetology, but in doing that, because now I am seeing in particular, many young men that are getting their hair colored, it's, et cetera, and I haven't done a survey, so I don't know whether they're getting these, this done in regular salons or whether they're doing it in barbershops. But to me, there seems to be a blurring here. So is the intent of this bill just to try and establish firmer uh, boundaries, so to speak? Mr. Grabanowski. Uh, yes, uh, Representative Mason. Um, that's exactly what this bill is trying to do is trying to better define some of the, the like you said, the, the blurring of the lines between barbering and cosmetology, specifically with straight razor shaving, because barbers traditionally consider that to be a barber service. And there was some confusion in the OLA report whether or not barbers were allowed to do waxing. So we wanted to better define that that is not a barber service. Barbers are allowed to do colors, um, just like cosmetologists are. So um, there is some overlap in between what the two different professions can do. But, but yes, our intent is to try to, try, try to better define the two different industries. So is there yeah. much difference? Representative between, uh, Mason. Is, thank you. Is there much difference between what it takes to, to do the hair coloring for cosmetology versus a barber? Mr. Grabinowski. There's no, the, the way you do colors in both are the same. Um, yeah, I, the, the procedures are the same um, in both. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, we're going to pause here for a second. Um, I've been informed that we have a amendment. This will be an oral amendment. Um, for explanation, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Mr. Gearing, if you could please provide uh, an explanation to the amendment. Mr. Um, Gearing. Uh, Mr. I'm actually, uh, my colleague Anna Sholeen is on the call, um, and she drafted okay. the amendment, so I might defer to her to walk through what it is. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, can you repeat who will be explaining right. the amendment again? Uh, Anna Sholeen, Ms. Sholeen, also from House Research. Ms. Sholeen, okay. Ms. Sholeen, if you could uh, please explain the amendment. I, I'm, uh, Chair and members, uh, we have a paper version of the amendment. Uh, did that just not meet the deadline? Um, I'm informed that we can, this seems pretty simple, that we could just do this as an oral amendment. Um, okay. If, but if there okay. can be some just brief Would explanation so that the the members have a clear understanding of what they're voting on. Uh, would this be the uh, page 12, line nine, after hours insert of study, which is in the discretion of, which in the discretion of the board has curriculum requirements that are equivalent to the requirements in section 15, uh, 154.07. Uh, and so this would just be saying that uh, the hours the cosmetologists are getting credit for towards their, their barber hours requirement would need to be ones that the barber board agreed are covering the same sort of material, such as hair coloring, which would be the same in both sets of courses. Okay. Um, trying to Mr. think of this. Is, yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Who has, uh, who just? Uh, that's Representative Nash. Representative, sorry. Am I, I've got multiple screens going on here. Representative Nash, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, to the chair regarding the oral amendment, did the, did the written amendment not get submitted in time or? Yeah. Uh, Kind of looking for Mr. clarification. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chair Nelson. Uh, rep um, I, uh, this is my first knowledge of the amendment. I never got it. Um, uh, our staff never got it, but we're laying this over. So, and when we bring this back up to, we could put the amendment on 
when we late when we put this in the in the um, in an omnibus bill if we have if we have the omnibus bill. Um, so I, I think that would be the better way to go about it. But it's the first I've seen the amendment, and it's uh, but it sounds like it's a pretty simple amendment. Okay, and Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, Representative Nash. Mr. Chair, and to Representative Nelson, it, so I gather this is not your amendment. Do we know who is offering this amendment? Um, I think Mr. Grubanowski Grib has has an answer to that. Or maybe not. Oh, I'm sorry. I was waiting for you to give me permission. Yes, to speak. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Kurbanowski, <laughs> can you provide some clarity uh, with regards to the amendment? Please? Sure. Uh, the amendment was made uh, to the cosmetology reciprocity portion of the bill. Um, when the bill was jacketed by the revisor's office, they, they did a great job taking our language and changing it for clarity and to conform with their standards. Um, however, I missed an omission in their draft. And, and what it would do would be allow the board to look and see what the education of a cosmetologist is who is applying for reciprocity and comparing that to what barbers are required to have here in Minnesota so that we could give credit for, um, for their education. Right now, the way the bill was written would automatically give someone a thousand hours if they were licensed um, from any state or country. So technically a person from another country could have a 200 hour class and have a license in their country and we'd have to give them credit for a thousand hours so that's what the amendment is about uh, okay chair nelson this sounds like more than what we can do with an oral amendment so to your point in regards to uh incorporating this at a later uh time since this bill will be laid over is um is that the course of action you wish to proceed with mr Ch mr chair yeah i think that would that would be better because i hadn't seen the amendment before and the, it's it seems like it's relatively straight, straightforward, but um, we're, we'll be taking this up later when we when when and if we uh, put it into an omnibus bill, and uh, so um, yeah, we can do it at that time. I think that would be better for the committee and everybody. Okay, fair enough. Um, thank you, Chair Nelson, uh, and Mr. Uh, Grebanowski. Thank you for the explanation there, uh, members. So we're going to keep our comments to the bill before us. Uh, further, there is no further testifiers. Member questions. Any member questions? I'm not seeing any hands up. Okay, Chair Nelson, uh, closing comments to your bill. As I said in my opening comments, this is just an update of the Barber Examiner Board statue and um, um, or the Board of Barber Examiner statue and uh, uh, just modernizing it and, and dealing with some things from the offer from the OLA report that came out on cosmetologists. So members, um, that's that's what the bill does. Okay. Chair Nelson uh, would uh, like for House File 3986 be laid over for possible inclusion. With that, the bill has been laid over. I'll turn the gavel back over to Chair Nelson. Thank you, members. Thank you, uh, Representative Carlson. Um, the next bill we have on our agenda is House File 2747, Representative Claiborne. Um, and there, Representative Claiborne, if you wanna make your motion. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that uh, House File 2747 be moved to the General Register. And I see there's a couple of amendments. Um, mm -hmm. Which one is yours? Uh, mine is the A1, thank you. Um, the A1 amendment. Do you want to move your amendment and explain what the amendment does? I move the A1, and because of the detail of the A1, it looks very simple, but I would like to ask Mr. Gehring if he would explain the need for this uh, amendment and the narrowing that this amendment does for us. Mr. Gehring? Mr. Gehring, if you want to explain what this amendment does. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, Matt Gehring from House Research. Um, uh, so lines 1.2 and 1.3 um, narrow the scope of um, how this bill would apply so that it doesn't apply to um, uh, public officials, but instead applies to candidates for elected office. Um, so uh, Representative Cleaver could probably describe sort of the general intent of the bill, um, yeah. but this is targeting um, uh, 
uh, receipts of contributions that are made by lobbyists um, for access to certain spaces. And um, instead of uh, sort of restricting access to spaces where public officials might attend, might sort of congregate, this is limited more towards um, spaces where candidates for uh, elected office would congregate. Uh, so that's what you see on lines uh, 1.2, 1.3 of the amendment. Uh, line 1.4 of the amendment uh, is getting rid of the word primary. Um, and that, uh, I can't remember where that fits in the bill. Sorry yes. about that. Um, okay. Mr. Gearing, I think the, <laughs> yeah, and the fact that public officials is so broad, that's uh, the piece I was concerned about. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Cleavard, the, the remainder of the amendment I would describe as um, roughly technical cleanup language just to um, uh, make sure that we're using the terms as they're used in Chapter 10A and talking about which types of um, groups are subject to this restriction uh, and um, uh, how we're describing the way that these groups would provide access to public to, to candidates for office. So members, um, that's the A1 amendment. Um, it's to put the bill in the, in the order that the author wishes. Um, all, if you want to unmute, all in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. And Representative Claiborne, is the A2 amendment yours or is that? The A2 amendment is not mine. Oh, well, then, Representative Claiborne, if you want to describe your bill and then and we Mr. will. Jerry, A2 is mine. Okay. Um, we'll let it, but then Representative Nash will let Representative Claiborne explain her bill and then we can um, take up the A2 amendment. Representative Claiborne. And Thank you. Um, Chair Nelson and members, um, House File 27, well, I'll just start it this way. Uh, is House File 2747 is really a ban on pay-to-play contributions to gain access to legislators. Voters have an innate belief that certain people have more privileged access and that government only answers to those who pay for it. Permitting social access clubs would confirm those beliefs. House File 2747 is a ban on pay-to-play contributions to gain access to legislators during the regular legislative or special legislative sessions. Where did this bill come from? The Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board issued an advisory opinion, 454, on October 6th of 2021. Mr. Ricardo Lopez reported on this advisory opinion in the Minnesota Reformer on November 12th of 2021. His article, Senate GOP gets okay to create pri private club for legislators, lobbyists during the special session, brought my attention to the matter and the rules around forming special access clubs and the issue of transparency and undue influence. Mr. Lopez also reported that the Senate GOP's campaign committee, the Senate Victory Fund, confirmed that they had requested the opinion. The existing campaign finance statutes make it permissible for a legislative caucus to set up a space where, leg where lobbyists and other political groups and associations would be required to pay a membership fee in order to meet with legislators of that caucus. This bill closes the gap in our statutes. So here's what the bill does. The bill expands the existing prohibition on campaign contributions during a legislative session to prohibit at any time of the year certain contributions by a registered lobbyist, political committee, political fund, or other association if, this is an important if, in exchange for the contribution, a registered lobbyist or other individual is granted special access to a meeting room, a hospitality area, or event space where public officials are likely to gather. And the primary purpose of granting that access is to facilitate informal meetings or socialization with public officials during the regular or special sessions of the legislature. With me today to talk to this, uh, the importance of this bill, and I don't know if uh, Chair Nelson, you have uh, Judge Beck, or if you have Mrs. Belladonna on Miss Belladonna on the testifier list first. 
but they are here to speak to um, the bill. And I would and, ask uh, that you please go to them. And Representative Claiborne, I have Mr. Beck, I have Ms. Belladonna Correa, and I have Mr. Sigurdsson if, if needed to answer questions. And uh, um, why don't we first get take care of the A2 amendment, Representative Nash? Um, I will understand that's your amendment. It is, Mr. Chair. I would move the A2 and request a roll call. Representative Nash moves the A2 amendment um, and requests the roll call. Representative Nash, what does your amendment do? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And you know, we've talked a lot about transparency and accountability. And during the peacetime emergency. Uh, we saw a number of things happening at the legislature that were behind closed doors. There were um, things that were not available to the public. We had members of the public that would try to testify on bills that were uh, being presented in committee that were on Zoom meetings. So uh, in the vein that Representative Claiborne is saying that she would like to make sure that um, transparency is uh, paramount, that is the the gist of my amendment that no vote can be cast um, by the legislature during a uh, any time if the public is not able to observe the legislation in person so i uh, i thank you for your support and renew my motion for the roll call and representative claiborne it's your bill what is your um thank you what, what, what do you feel about the with the amendment yes yeah. I really appreciate the amendment and I appreciate the intent behind Representative Nash's amendment. Unfortunately, um, our Capitol building was built long ago and it has a very small gallery space. If, we, if there were a member of the public who wanted to attend and could not fit into that gallery space safely, uh, we would not be able to take votes on the floor of the house. Further, um, I spoke to Capital Security about whether or not this would be feasible, and I was told that there could be times when there would be a legitimate threat and we would need to close the gallery, and that um, under our current situation, members of the public are able to view what is happening through technology in the Capitol at all times whenever we are in session. So that uh, it was believed that this particular amendment was not necessary for the public to be able to be fully informed. Therefore, I am requesting a no vote. Well, there's a, one other piece. I want to make sure that the bill that I bring forward is very clear, and it's in Chapter 10. And the amendment that uh, Representative Nash is bringing forward is in Chapter 3. So I want to keep uh, this bill clean to Chapter 10. So thank you very much. And I Mr. Chair, to no vote. Represent, Representative Nash. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I will just uh, point out that uh, it is not just floor votes, it is committee votes. Committee votes is where so many people were actually turned away by DFL committee administrators and chairs. They were not allowed to testify, they were not allowed to weigh in on things, they were not allowed to do anything. A number of people have made that very, very clear on social media and to me personally. And Representative Claiborne, I serve on capital area security, and I okay. know this very well. There has not been an expressed uh, overriding issue with having people in public in the Capitol. The Capitol, as you pointed out, was built to receive people. It is the people's home. It is the people's house. And while I appreciate the effort of your bill, um, I will point out that the DFL has gone to extraordinary lengths to keep people out of the public and keep them out of places where votes are being cast. So uh, a, a no vote for this is a vote against public uh, interaction and against transparency. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Chair Nelson, may I respond, please? Representative Claiborne, quickly. Okay. Um, Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll keep my comments very short. Um, I will just like to remind the committee that I have spoken to Capital Security, the people who are responsible for making sure that both the public and the legislative body are safe. And uh, they uh, told me that there are legitimate reasons for not accepting this amendment. And with that, uh, I will ask for a no vote. Thank you. With that, members, uh, Representative Nash has moved the A2 amendment on the request of the roll call. Mr. Brinks, we want to take the roll. Thank you. Chair Nelson. No. Nelson votes nay. Vice Chair Carlson. Carlson, no. Carlson votes nay. Representative Nash. Yes. Nash votes aye. 
Representative Bonner. No. Bonner votes nay. Representative Drozkowski. Aye. Drozkowski votes aye. Representative Elkins. Elkins votes no. Elkins votes nay. Representative Greenman. No. Greenman votes no. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn votes no. Cleborn votes no. Representative Kosnick. Yes. Kosnick votes aye. Representative Mason. Mason, no. Mason votes nay. Representative New Brindley. Yes. New Brindley votes aye. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, no. Pulowski votes nay. Representative Plum. With the voice of my constituents, I vote yes. Quam votes aye. Chair, with a vote of eight ayes, or excuse me, five ayes and eight nays, the motion does not prevail. The motion does not prevail. Um, we'll Chan. get on to our, Representative yeah. Claiborne, we'll get on to our testifiers. I'd like to just reground us on the uh, subject matter of the bill, since that took us down a little bit of a different path. The subject matter of the bill is a ban on pay to play contribution. And with that, I ask that we go to our testifier. Um, Thank you, Representative Claiborne. Uh, the first person on my list is uh, George Beck. Uh, Mr. Beck, if you want to introduce yourself for the record and please begin your testimony. Mr. Chair, uh, my name is George Beck. I'm on the board of Clean Elections of Minnesota. Last year, the Senate Victory Fund sought and received the approval of the Campaign Finance Board to create a loophole around the law prohibiting campaign contributions during the legislative session. The fund proposed to create what amounts to a private club during the session for its legislators and then invited lobbyists and others seeking legislators time and favors. The general public was not welcome. The club would be supported by contributions from lobbyists made prior to the session. Access would then be provided during the session based on those pre-session payments. The board unfortunately decided that this did not violate the no contributions during the session law. But in fact, it created a special opportunity for lobbyists and their clients who had circumvented state law by prepaying for the exclusive privilege to lobby elected officials while the legislature was in session. This undemocratic special interest plan at least violates the spirit of state law and needs to be clearly outlawed. House file 2747 specifically prohibits contributions from lobbyists at any time of the year, which is used to provide special access to a meeting with legislators during a regular or a special session. To his credit, Senate Majority Leader Jeremy Miller has recently been quoted as saying that he has no plans to hold such an event. I think therefore this bill should have bipartisan support and we hope it receives unanimous support from this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beck. Um, the next person I have on my list is Anastasia Belladonna Correa. And I hope I said that <laughs> properly. Welcome to the committee. And please state your name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For those of you that I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is Anastasia Belladonna Carrera and I'm the Executive Director for Common Cause Minnesota. I'm here on behalf of over 18,000 multipartisan statewide members and supporters. And despite belonging to various affiliations, some not even affiliated, the whole thing that brings everyone together in supporting our work is ensuring that our republic's democracy is safeguarded, our elections continue to reflect the will of Minnesotans, and that everyone's vote counts. We are concerned about the increased lack of access to the state legislature and lawmakers for constituents, particularly these last two years being the period when we received the most statewide complaints from constituents. Public conference committees appear to become a thing of the past. Negotiations have moved behind closed doors, shutting the public out and making it virtually impossible for constituents to most importantly, be aware of how things are happening and hold members accountable. The bill will prevent, this particular bill will prevent yet another advantage to capital insiders. Representative Cleveland already made reference to the advisory opinion as did Judge Beck 
or uh, Mr. Beck, uh, with regards to the um, campaign finance board related to this issue. Common Cause Minnesota took issue as well with regards to that position. We do not agree with it for the reasons that Mr. Beck already cited. We're relieved when Senator Miller spoke unfavorably to this idea and are grateful that Representative Cleburne took action to prevent these types of insider clubs from becoming a common occurrence in Minnesota. Our position is that any time a member of the legislature finds themselves with extra time, that should be spent within their districts, directly engaging with all of their constituents, learning more about how issues impact every corner of their district and not behind closed doors of any type of insider club between lobbyists and electives. This bill addresses the need to prevent pay to play lobbyist clubs, granting special interest groups access to key decision makers while keeping constituents in the public and other community stakeholders out. Common Cause and our members are opposed to any idea that creates an unequal access for Minnesota constituents at the Capitol to their legislators, they, or in any other space, actually. This is why we support the bill before us. We thank Representative Cleveland for bringing this important bill forward. We're especially appreciative that it's a common sense bill written within a narrow scope and based on an issue that merits bipartisan support. Please put constituents first by supporting House File 2747. And Representative Nash, I would love to work with you and revisit the re increasing access and transparency that I saw in the spirit of your bill, because we too received similar complaints about some of the things that you highlight. So I'd love to connect with you later. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of the committee, for your time and hard work. And with that, I, uh, again, Mr. Siegert is here to answer questions as needed. Uh, Ms. Representative New Brindley, I see you have your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, Representative Cleveland, I certainly like the spirit of this bill. I think the whole issue was silly. However, um, I, I do have a question. I mean, first of all, I, I think that there are, is some gray area that every single legislator participates in. That and, and I don't mean gray area in that it's nefarious. I mean gray area as it relates to this bill. So, for example, um, every caucus holds caucus fundraisers where uh, donations are required to participate in the fundraiser. The Democrat ca House Caucus does it. The uh, Republican House Caucus does it. Both the Senate caucuses do it. We all hold fundraisers. Um, and where I am concerned is that is is this idea in on lines 2.5 and 2.6, the primary purpose of granting special access is to facilitate informal meetings or socialization with public officials during a regular or special session of the legislature. I mean, is there a reason that we couldn't assume that a fundraiser would would be for the purpose of um, facilitating informal meetings or socialization. What is to prevent that interpretation of this bill? Representative Claiborne. Uh, I, will, I will ask Mr. Siegertson to help with this clarification, please. Mr. Siegertson, please identify yourself for the record and, and give us your answer. Good morning, Chair, uh, May members. My name is Jeff Sigurdsson, the Executive Director of the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board. Uh, recall that this is amending a, a statute that prohibits contributions during the legislative session. So while the caucuses may have fundraisers, they cannot have fundraisers during the regular legislative session. So that isn't affected by, by this particular provision. Fundraisers outside of legislative session, of course, could still occur. But even under current statute, uh, you would not be able to have a, a fundraiser by the caucus during the legislative session. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and and I, I totally understand that. And thank you, Mr. Sigurdsson, for that. I, I certainly understand the current provisions and current law. My concern is adding 2.5 and 2.6. I think that is the purpose of those meetings is to provide informal meetings and socialization with public officials. And, um, and that carries through to being in session. Um, and, and, and frankly, line 2.7 
says special access means privileges to enter and use a space that is not freely available to members of the public. Would that include my office? That's to Representative Cleborn, the author of the bill. What's the intent there? Would that include my office? That's the space would, that's not freely available to the public. Um, as a state office Represent, building? Representative Claiborne, Representative Claiborne. Excuse and me. Go through um, the chair, remember. We have to go through the chair. Apologize, Chair Nelson. Uh, to, uh, to answer the question, Chair Nelson, I would say that we do not charge anyone a fee to enter your office. Representative Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Of, of course we don't. Like that, that's absurd. Uh, but but the point is that this is not about anyone. This is this is specifically about lobbyist access. Um, and and while certainly, like I said, in in theory, I am I am supportive of this bill, and I'll likely and I will likely vote for the bill because, like I said, I think the issue was silly. I'm concerned about the language here. Um, that, that this could at some point be be considered. I mean, like I said, we all participate in fundraisers. We all participate in fundraisers that don't happen during session, but could be construed to offer influence during session or access during session. Um, and now, I, you know, I mean, frankly, this idea of creating special access to lobbyists there and their clients. Um, frankly, I, I appreciate Ms. Uh, Belladonna Carrera's testimony. And frankly, we've had many conversations. I don't, and I could be wrong. I could be wrong, Anastasia. And I apologize if I, if I am, but I don't know that we have ever um, talked to any fundraiser, but my office is always open to frankly lobbyists and their clients and their Clients are also known as our constituents <laughs> much of the time, most of the time. Uh, their clients are known as our constituents. I, I just, I, I get it. It's a, this is a good political stab at the Senate Republicans. And again, I agree that the whole concept was silly. Um, but I think there are concerns with the language. I'm going to vote for it, but be aware moving forward that there are real concerns with this language. And I think that you might want to clean that up a little bit um, before voting for this off the House floor. Uh, Mr. Chair. Hey, thank you, Representative Brindley. Re um, Representative Claiborne. Uh, thank you very much, um, Representative New Brindley. And certainly I would be happy to work with you going forward on any bill that you think would clean up campaign finance. I think that's a really great idea. And frankly, um, if it were up to me, I would have no money in um, our public campaigns at all. But, um, and they would be publicly sponsored, but that's a different bill on a different day. Um, when, you, um, when you look at this bill, I just wanna make sure that we're all very clear. It's very narrow. And I'm, I am sure that you are not saying that you have ever taken a campaign contribution uh, that would cause you to uh, give that uh, constituent a, a special, uh, that, that, that is not what I thought I heard, what I thought you were saying. And certainly I wouldn't want you to imply that I would ever take a contribution that would gain some, some special privilege for any voter um, or member of uh, the lobbying community. And I wanna be very, very clear, this is not an anti-lobbying bill. Lobbying serves a very uh, uh, important purpose at the Capitol, and it can improve government. So I don't want to can anyone to construe that this is a, a bill against our lobbyists. Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no, and in fact, Representative Cleveland, what you're saying is exactly the opposite. The point is, my door is always open to lobbyists or anyone else. Now we hear a very different story about our Democrat friends in the house from the lobbying community that they have almost no access, um, but my door is almost always open. Uh, and, and again, because lobbyists, you, you call them clients, I call them constituents actually, um, lobbyists and their clients, my constituents. Uh, and and the, that's exactly the point. I think this language is not quite as narrow as you think it is, and that's the problem. Um, 
again, we all participate, all of our caucuses participate in fundraisers that could be construed then to provide access. Those, those fundraisers do not happen during the legislative session. Um, that is very clearly defined in law. Um, but when but when you include lines 2.5 and 2.6, that the primary purpose of granting the special access is to facilitate informal meetings or socialization. I mean, the granting special access was just a fundraiser. If you're if you're coming to the event, you're you're paying money to attend an event. Like it, the language in here is gray. I understand that you believe it's very narrow. But it's not. Um, it's it's not. And and again, I, I would question what that means. Privileges to enter and use that space is not freely available to members of the public. Am I going to get dinged that I participated in a fundraiser and then later on that lobbyist is invited into my office for a meeting? Now I understand that everyone on the call is saying no, no, that wouldn't possibly happen. That's what the that's what the that's what the words in the bill could allow for, and that's my concern. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's your concern, Representative Nash. You you have your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I I was going to make some of the same points that Representative Brindley did, but I'll just point out that if you follow me on social media, you know that I have had office hours in the rotunda of the Capitol, and yeah, I have gone to extraordinary and some might say stunt oriented uh, lengths to meet with constituents, meet with lobbyists, meet with anybody who wants to show up. I actually had what I call a couple of pickup meetings of people who were just wandering by and they said, what an amazing thing that somebody would go to the trouble of making themselves available when the state office building is closed during this time. And I would say uh, we are well past the time that it should be closed. And I, I will say, I'm disappointed that we didn't take the A2 amendment because it is it is very much oriented in the, the spirit of transparency. Uh, I will tell you many of my constituents feel that they have been deprived of access to legislators. They have been deprived of the ability to testify in committee. They have actually been kept out of testifying for committee. And I can go into a litany of, of examples. I won't now because I see the face of the chair. But I, I will be more than happy to talk about the times where people who wanted to testify have been turned away. So while I will vote for the bill, I find it to be uh, somewhat hypocritical that we are not similarly addressing access of the public to places like Mrs. Uh, Ms. Belladonna Carrera talked about, about conference committees not being open. And you all are in the majority. You all have gavels. You all decide who does and does not come in to conference committees uh, when you have the gavel. And I think this is, this is a, I mean, let's face it, making fun of the Senate is always good fun, right? But this is not quite enough. And I feel that you are not addressing the actual needs that many Minnesotans are expressing, which is the denial of access to you uh, again, I, I have a card table and a folding chair and a poster that uh, looks just like the Peanuts cartoon uh, that I set up in the rotunda. So don't tell me that that we are not interested in transparency and availability. Okay. That's that that may uh, represent Cleveland. I'm not done yet. Thank you. I'm happy to wait, wait till you're you. wait till you're recognized. So I will, I will tell you that I'll vote for this bill. I think the commentary from Representative New Brindley is, is absolutely germane to this bill and important. And I am just beyond frustrated because my constituents are frustrated. Your constituents are frustrated. I actually met in the rotunda with some of your constituents who were there trying to get access to you. And I will be honest, I told them, well, the decision of the, of the majority in the House has been to not allow you access to the state office building. So um, I, I think this is a, an okay bill. It needs some tuning up and I hope that Representative Clavor Claiborne is true to her word and she will work with whomever brings an amendment. But uh, I, I think that this is not quite enough. And um, I, I just wanna go on record as saying that. Thank you, Representative okay. Nash. Representative Greenman, you have a, your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I don't know Representative Cleveland, um 
had asked to speak and I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't jumping in. Representative Claiborne, I rec Representative Greenman, I've recognized you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Representative Cleborne, uh, for bringing this bill. As you can tell, I have a little bit of a cold, so I'm going to keep it uh, short. But I just, um, as, as somebody who served on the Campaign Finance Board, and uh, really appreciate the, the testimony of, of, of Judge Beck, because I think what this bill does is uh, close a loophole. Um, and just to reorient us, um, it really just does close a loophole uh, to ensure that uh, uh, lobbyists, that there is not these special clubs um, uh, um, and special access. And it's not a hypothetical because we actually saw um, uh, folks on the other side, it's not a joke or uh, uh, poking fun at the Senate. It is actually in response to um, what I would call an innovation uh, to try to skirt uh, campaign finance laws. Uh, but this is actually very much needed. Um, it's unfortunate that it's needed because I, I agree that in the spirit of, um, of the campaign finance laws, this kind of uh, um, uh, 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 behavior would be prohibited, but I think given uh, that that we need to respond to the to to that uh, innovation that that we saw move forward. So I just really appreciate uh, Representative Cleaver and you doing the work with the uh, and consulting the Campaign Finance Board to make sure that this rule um, is tailored to uh, reflect our current law and tailored to uh, um, prevent this kind of access. That I know that Minnesotans and constituents in my district. Um, Care about and it's great actually to hear on this committee um, uh, that there's going to be bipartisan support because I think we all agree and want to want to make sure that our constituents know that our door is open uh, to Minnesotans. Um, there is no special back room uh, um, that comes, and so thank you again for for bringing this bill. Thank you, Representative Greenman. Uh, Representative Skalski, you have your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Claiborne, thank you for the bill. Uh, I agree with the. Uh, the the bill wholeheartedly. Um, we um, we have to continue to endeavor to do work in this area, wherever there are decisions being made that affect people throughout Minnesota, and there's money accumulating in order to try to come in and influence those decisions. Uh, there's going to be needs for us as a legislature to be as innovative, uh, using Representative Greenman's word, um, uh, and nimble as they are. Uh, because they will continue to try to do this. Um, you know, I brought the amendment uh, last session that, uh, that that started to started to work in this area. We need to do what you're doing here. I thank you for reaching out to me. Uh, I have read the language now in whole, and I'm going to sign on to your bill. Um, I would also encourage you to entertain uh, what Representative Nash was talking about. We need to make things more accessible around here. We're not done with this this bill yet. Maybe. We can have those those discussions. Uh, also, Representative Greenman and I are working on some work out of my lobbyist uh, bill from from a week or so ago, and and we're going to be meeting with the Campaign Finance Board, Mr. Sigurdsson, um, on that. I don't know if he knows that yet. We're hoping to. Um, so there could be some other parts we need we could do, and I would I would ask you to entertain that as we go forward. But thank you for the bill, and um, let's uh, make this a Minnesota where. Uh, the people, the voters, are the ones that have the, the greatest influence on legislators, and not the um, the high-paid lobbyists that uh, roam the Capitol. And that, and believe me, they're very capable people, and they're paid very well. I, I do understand that uh, they're very good at what they do. Uh, we just uh, want to make certain that the the best access and the proper access is for our constituents, the people of Minnesota. So thank you, Representative Cleaver. <coughs> Thank you, Representative Skowski and uh, Representative Claiborne, if you want to wrap up and we'll get to a vote. Well, I'm um, very pleased that uh, the House, <laughs> the House is very clear that we should have free and accessible um, access to legislators so that all Minnesota's voices can be heard. I think that's a really great thing. And I just want to make sure that my colleagues um, on both sides of the table understand that my bringing this bill forward is in no way saying that they um, are not freely available to their constituents. I think the House is pretty good about making sure that we um, see our constituents, talk to our constituents, and are readily available to our constituents. I mean, we are the awesome House of Representatives. But what this bill does truly is closes a gap that we have found 
in our campaign finance law. And it says yes to Minnesotans that they deserve fair, open, and transparent rules around campaign finance. It says that access to legislators is not for sale. And it says that we should always keep Minnesotans in front and center of the work that we do. Members, I thank you for the support that you've expressed today. And I ask for your yes vote as we send this on to the general register. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Claiborne. And with that, Representative Claiborne, you wanna renew your motion? I renew my motion that House File 2747 be moved to the general register. As amended. As amended, thank you. Representative Claiborne renews her motion that House File 2747 as amended be referred to the general register. Mr. Brinks, do you wanna take the roll? Thank you. Chair Nelson. Aye. Nelson votes aye. Vice Chair Carlson. Aye. Carlson votes aye. Representative Nash. Aye. Nash votes aye. Representative Bonner. Aye. Bonner votes aye. Representative Drozkowski. Aye. Drozkowski votes aye. Representative Elkins. Elkins votes aye. Elkins votes aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Greenman votes aye. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn aye. Cleborn votes aye. Representative Kosnick. Aye. Kosnick votes aye. Representative Mason. Mason aye. Mason votes aye. Representative New Brindley. No. New Brindley votes nay. Representative Pulowski is excused. Representative Quam. No. Quam votes nay. Chair, with a vote of 10 ayes, two nays, and one excuse, the motion prevails. The motion prevails. The motion, the bill's on its way to the general register. And members, uh, the next bill and all we have on our agenda is Representative Nash's House File 2857. And Representative Nash, this is going to the General Register. Do you want to make your motion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that House File 2857 uh, be referred to the General Register, and I have two author's amendments I would like to engross. Um, okay, I'm, Representative Nash. Um, Representative Claiborne had an amendment. I think she just wants to, to yeah. talk about her amendment and. Representative Claiborne. Chair, is, it, is it not customary that the author's amendments get taken up first? Representative, believe, Representative Claiborne, I believe she wants to, wants to withdraw yeah. her amendment. Representative Claiborne. That's correct, Chair Nelson. Um, I spoke with Representative Nash yesterday and his amendment and my amendment are very, very similar. Um, I would just ask that um, we, we support this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Claiborne. Representative Nash, that's, that's why I wanted to ask her first. Dr. First Representative Nash, you've got the A1 and the A2 amendment, you said? Uh, I have the A1 and the A4, Mr. Chair. A1 and the A4. Um, Representative Nash, you want to you move your amendment and explain the A1 amendment? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. This uh, The A1 is a, uh, a further clarification of what is sample ballot. Uh, that was in response to several of the conversations I had offline, both with you and other members who were uh, interested in further clarifying that. It also deals uh, with uh, what, um, well, with what the, a lot of the criticism or, or concerns were. So, um, again, it's, it's putting in language that would make it so that uh, a reasonable person would not be able to mistake it as an official ballot. Thank you, Representative Nash. Um, Representative Nash moves the A1 amendment to put the bill in the way he wants it. Um, if you want to unmute members, all in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? A1 amendment's adopted. And the next is the A4 amendment. Representative Nash, do you want to move your amendment and explain it? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I would move the A4. And the, the A4, again, takes into consideration some of the commentary that I got from uh, both members of the public and from some folks who really want to see this bill move forward. Um, and it, it deletes uh, the, one of the clauses, um, subdivision two, that has been causing people uh, issue. And we may, we may uh, work on that further, but uh, so the, the A2, just tightens things up a little bit further in response to some of the uh, outreach that I got. 
Uh, thank you, Representative Nash. And Representative Nash, I got some feedback about the bold letters that you put that you want printed on there about um, font size and uh, um, in this case size matters. If it's tiny font, no one's going to see it. No matter if it's no matter if it's uh, um, in bold letters or not. But uh, that's something we can work on further. Uh, yeah, members, thank you, any, thank you Mr. Chair. And, and and yes, I, I did talk to a couple of different folks about uh, the font size and and. You know, we could talk about that and make sure that it, it is defined as something that is uh, readable. I, I can bring that to the House floor as an author's amendment, but I, I did want to get this to the floor. Um, and members, you will see in your packets that there are uh, there's a letter that has been submitted um, in support of this. So I uh, would hope that we would be able to move that forward. So um, if I if I would be open to questions on the amendment, Mr. Chair. Any questions on the amendment for members? Again, this is to put it in the in the shape that the author wants. Seeing no hands popping, Representative Greenman. I uh, almost spoke you, too Mr. soon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Nash. And I just, uh, for clarification, because I believe Representative Cleveland and and your amendments were uh, pretty similar, and I wanted to to make sure that I came uh, with feedback from the Secretary of State. Um, Miss Freeman, are you? I see you're on my screen, Ms. Freeman. You you want to answer the question about the the office? If you want to identify, identify yourself for the record, please. Sure, um, Nicole Freeman, Office of Secretary of State. Um, we did provide feedback um, for the amendments. I I didn't know if it was a question that Representative Freeman was asking or a statement she was making. Um, but yes, we our office did provide feedback on the amendments. And we are in support of the amendments. Yep. Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that clarification. I just wasn't, it wasn't clear from uh, uh, Representative Nash's statement about uh, where the feedback came from. So I just wanted to make sure that, um, uh, and I know that that some of the concerns that we raised um, when we heard this bill uh, um, a few weeks ago, um, especially about subdivision two, but also about some of the uh, um, concerns about how you would execute the first one. Um, we're clarified in this amendment that both ended up in Representative Cleveland and Representative Nash's amendment. And I just uh, wanted to clarify that I think that, that a lot of that is coming from the folks who uh, talk to the counties who will administer the elections. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Greenman. Representative, um, if there's no further questions of the amendment, again, to put it in the, the shape the author wants, uh, members, um, unmute your mics. All in favor of the A4 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Um, Representative Nash, you want to explain your bill? I think we, we heard this last a couple weeks ago, but please just briefly explain your bill again. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the committee uh, as a quick refresher and to the public watching. This bill would make it so that any organization, entity, or otherwise that is sending out a request for a, an absentee ballot so that you get many of us got them in the mail and many of our constituents got them and were very frustrated because they thought they were actual ballots. But this would would uh, require anybody sending out a ballot an absentee ballot request form print on the outer envelope. This is not uh, an actual ballot and is not sent by a government entity and so on. So we, we have spoken about this. Uh, and Mr. Chair, there is a letter in the packet, as I had said, from uh, the Association of Minnesota Counties and Minnesota Association of County Officers and the League of Minnesota Cities, uh, all saying that they support this. And as Representative Greenman said, these are the people who are largely responsible for administering the elections in the localities that we all serve. So uh, with that, I can stand for questions or we can move to a vote. Oh, I see one hand up right now, Representative Drzkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the bill, uh, Representative Nash. I really like the bill. I think it makes a, a great deal of sense and I'm glad to see it moving forward and all the work you're doing on it. The one question I have is, so so what? We do this and we put this in law. What are the consequences at that point for an organization or an individual that violates what you, you laid out here? Because uh, they may not even read the law. They may just mail. So what what are the consequences? Uh, Representative Nash. Yeah, and thank you, Mr. Chair. I would actually ask uh, Mr. Gehring, who helped me draft this, if he could address some of the penalty clauses or penalty uh, situations, or perhaps Mr. Sigurdsson, um, if we could. 
We'll start with Mr. Gehring. Mr. Gehring. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Jaskowski and Nash, um, Matt Gehring from House Research. Um, this uh, bill is proposing to code this prohibition in Chapter 211B, which is the Fair, Cam Fair Campaign Practices Act. And um, as written, the uh, remedy process would be an administrative process through the Office of Administrative Hearing. So they have a, the OAH has an existing sort of rubric that they use to determine penalties when they receive uh, complaints about violations of the Fair Campaign Practices Act. And this would sort of fit within that rubric, depending on the um, you know, severity of the violation and sort of history of the offender and that sort of thing. So there's not a specific penalty specified in the bill, but there's a process that's, that the OAH uses to sort of impose penalties um, under current law. Representative Skowski. Uh, awesome, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that answers my question. We do have something and we can always build on that. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Gehring. Thank you, Representative Nash and Mr. Chair. Any further questions? Any further questions? Seeing no hands jumping up on my screen and no one waving frantically in their in their video pictures. Um, Representative Nash, do you want to renew your motion? Yes, Mr. Chair, I would renew my motion that House File 2857 be referred to the General Register as amended. As amended. House File motion is to be removed, refer House File 2857 as amended to the General Register. Mr. Brinks. Please take the roll. Thank you. Chair Nelson. Aye. Nelson votes aye. Vice Chair Carlson. Aye. Carlson votes aye. Representative Nash. Aye. Nash votes aye. Representative Bonner. Aye. Bonner votes aye. Representative Justkowski. Aye. Justkowski votes aye. Representative Elkins. Elkins, aye. Elkins votes aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Greenman votes aye. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn, aye. Cleborn votes aye. Representative Kosnick. Aye. Kosnick votes aye. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. Mason votes aye. Representative New Brindley. Aye. New Brindley votes aye. Representative Pulowski is excused. Representative Plum. Aye. Plum votes aye. Chair with a vote of 12 ayes and one excuse. The motion prevails. The motion prevails. The bill's on its way to the general register. Members, uh, that's the last minute thing on our agenda. We have our next meeting is next Tuesday, March 15th. And they say, beware the Ides of March. Um, uh, we have some bills in, on the agenda. Um, we did add one to the agenda, the bill on uh, Russian disinvestment, from Representative Jordan. Um, so members, with that, I hope you all have a good weekend. And with that, members, we are adjourned.